to 
Hey, good morning. Just want to welcome you to another online gathering for Catalyst Church. We're, uh, we're really glad you're joining us this morning, and we hope that uh, your experience with this today is going to be, uh, be encouraging. Um, I don't know about you, but I uh, feel like we are coming off one of the strangest Easter's we've ever experienced. And as we continue on this week, we're going to be looking at a new series that we're calling Joyful. And it is um, a study through the book of Philippians. And I think it's going to be super appropriate coming off of the celebration of Easter. Um, and especially now with uh, life feeling as strange as it does, um, as different as it does, the good news is there's still joy to be found. I want to mention one thing um, before we jump into the message this morning. If you have started um, engaging with Catalyst since we've been online, I want to I want to encourage you to do something else to take maybe one more step to stay connected. If you go to our website, this is Catalyst.com. You can scroll down on that homepage, and there is a online form that you can fill out called Stay in the Loop. And it is a great way for you to stay in the loop. You'll get uh, all the information that we're sending out throughout the week. Uh, we send uh, two to three different emails throughout the week with different words of encouragement, different opportunities for you to get connected beyond just sitting with us on a Sunday morning. I'd really recommend you doing that because more than anything else right now, uh, we really need each other. We really need connectedness. So again, visit thisiscatalyst.com. Um, just kind of search around the website. That's kind of our hub of all information right now, um, especially during this time. You can find a lot of great resources on there for you and your family. So like I said this morning, we're kicking off a brand new series that we're excited about. It's called Joyful. So a, a study through the book of Philippians. Pastor Chris is going to kick it off this morning. So I'm going to hand it off to Chris right now. Hey there, Catalyst Church. Good morning and welcome to uh, our church services online once again uh, this morning. As you can see, we are all filming from our homes to bring you our worship services because that's where you're at. And uh, we want to let you know from our home to yours uh, that we are just so honored that you would take the time to be a part of what we're doing here in providing our uh, worship services online. So especially if you're visiting uh, new with us uh, today, we just want to extend an extra special welcome to you 
you. Thanks for tuning in uh, with us for our service. And before we get into uh, this new series and the first message in that, I just wanted to extend an invitation to you guys because every single uh, Tuesday during this series in Philippians, we are going to be posting a question on the Catalyst Church's social media page. And so what we'd like you to do is to continue to check that. And when you see the question, uh, you can answer that question and uh, put that on your social media story, making sure to tag Catalyst Church, or you can film a video answer, post that on your story, making sure to tag the church. And uh, those are going to help us put together our messages for each week. We might even show uh, your video with your permission, of course, and we might even actually read some of your answers. So it's a way for you to interact with us and for you to be a part of every single uh, week's message. So we're going to begin our series uh, that we're calling Joyful, and it's a study through the book of Philippians, and uh, we're really excited to jump into this. And so before we hear from uh, what God has to say uh, here in this first chapter, will you pray with me as we open together? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts wherever it is that we're watching, whatever it is that we are going through in our personal lives, uh, whether we're surrounded and we feel surrounded by people we love or we're going through a season where we're feeling a bit lonely and disconnected. Holy Spirit, will you use your scriptures this morning to speak to our hearts? Teach us now through your word, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, I would love for you to go to Philippians chapter one as we are starting a brand new series uh, through this book. And so for about seven weeks, we're gonna be walking through this. And Philippians is a book that is all about joy. And uh, through this book, we're going to be unlocking uh, some of the keys to finding what we're calling life-changing joy. Now, you probably know as well as I do that there is a difference between uh, the, the pursuit of temporary happiness and the discovery of life-changing joy. Now, you probably are know happiness is, is something that is temporary and it's something that we pursue and maybe find sometimes. Like in my life, there are many things that make me happy. Now, a couple of the guilty pleasures that make me happy are um, Wiener Schnitzel chili dogs. So whenever I drive by a Wiener Schnitzel, I am extremely drawn to the drive through and I have to fight every temptation because Wiener schnitzel chili dogs make me so happy. The other one is Krispy Kreme donuts, especially when they've come like right out of the oven. They're just like melting in your mouth. The original glaze, it just kind of like oozes and you just, it melts in your mouth. And so I, I get so much pleasure out of eating those. But like when I'm done eating them, I, I'm receiving no more happiness from them. In fact, I, I might have, have a little bit of guilt associated with it. My family brings me an enormous amount of happiness, as I'm sure it does for you. But we also know that family it can be temporary when we lose family members that we love or, you know, things happen in relationships. Sometimes those, those relationships that once brought us happiness are no longer there. And so happiness is temporary. Some people find happiness in financial security. And as we know in this economy that we've found ourselves in over the last month, that our financial security can be ripped out from underneath us at any point. And what we thought was joy in financial security was actually only happiness because it was totally temporary. And many of us even find uh, happiness in the community that we live in or even in the church, but we always know that relationships change and problems happen. And so it seems like so many of the things that we have in our lives that give us happiness, we find that they're only temporary. I mean, even our founding fathers of the United States in our constitution say that there is a pursuit of happiness that is guaranteed for us. And it's, it's not that happiness is guaranteed, it's the pursuit of it. Well, joy is different than happiness. Joy is a state of being. It's a, it's a state of mind. It's a, a place where we stand, not just a feeling that we experience. See, happiness is like the root system of your lawn and your backyard. It's shallow and it can be pulled up very easily. But joy is like the root system of an oak tree that no matter what the circumstances are around that tree, those roots hold it in place. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably know of people that, that seem to be more joyful than others. And I've found that when I dig deeper into that person's life that seems to always be experiencing joy, what, what I've found, and you've probably found this to be true as well, is that they seem to have a very deep faith in God. The people that have joy 
are almost always, not always, but almost always, people that have a very deep belief in God and they have a trust in this unchanging, unshakable, and unwavering God that has a plan for their life and will uphold his promises because that's where joy comes from. Joy comes from something that is never changing. Now, happiness is, is not only easier to find because there's Krispy Kremes and there's Wiener Schnitzels and whatever it, those things that bring you happiness, those are all around us. They're easier to find, but they're also easier to steal. Now, joy is different in that it's much harder to find joy. It's much harder to hold on to joy once you have it, but it's also more difficult to steal. Those people that have a deep sense of joy very often don't have it stolen away from them until something significant happens in their lives. Things like loneliness, <clears throat> anxiety, suffering, humiliation, loss, poverty. Those deep senses in us have a tendency to rob and to steal our joy. Now, I remember the first time that I had something stolen from me. I think I was maybe seven or eight years old, and I had a lemonade stand out in front of my dad's house, and I spent all morning making the lemonade and figuring out how much I was going to charge. And, and I had good success early on as I had neighbors and friends came by and, and you know supported my little entrepreneurial business in my front yard, my lemonade stand. I was so happy with what I had created. I was so happy with my little business that I had started until this kid, this fifth grader at my school, who I didn't even really know, I just knew he he was a big fifth grader, came by, he grabbed my money box and rode off with his bike and stole that which was making me happy and that which was, what was starting to bring me a little bit of joy. And I realized that, that those things that, that bring us happiness and joy can so easily be stolen. But joy as a whole, when it is a joy that is built upon Jesus Christ and our faith in God, is something that can be more, that is more difficult to steal away from us. But here's the good news, is what Jesus, and in particular what the, what the book of Philippians promises us, is that we can still find joy, or we can still hold on to our joy, even in the midst of life's most difficult circumstances. So if you feel today, like maybe your joy is starting to be stolen from you, you're going through a rough time, I just want to encourage you to not miss a single week of this series. Or maybe if you know of someone who's going through a very difficult season in their life, invite them to watch with you. Send them the links and say, hey, we're doing this series on joy, and this is something I think is going to encourage you. And so we're going to start to look through this book of Philippians together, and it's going to help us unlock the secrets of what we're calling life-changing joy. So if you will with me, we're going to start walking through the first chapter of what is this first century letter in the Bible. Um, and today we're going to talk about what it's like to find or to hold on to joy in loneliness. So here's the opening of Philippians chapter 1. We're going to go chapter, or verses 1 through 11. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affections of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. So this book of Philippians, and in this section, as we get uh, ready to start through this, is, is the author of this book. You see that his name is first listed, and this is a, a classic way for these old uh, authors to be able to identify where this letter is coming from. And it's for coming from the Apostle Paul, who wrote, the, wrote this book and 
a lot of, in fact, the New, or the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, before he did all of this, and before he was a follower of Jesus, was a persecutor of Christians, and he oversaw the persecution and the, and the death sentences of early Christians, and Jesus Christ got a hold of his heart, met him in person after he had resurrected, and Paul, or Saul was his name, became the Apostle Paul, and he became a church planter and probably the greatest missionary that we have had in the last 2,000 years. And he writes the book of Philippians from house arrest. In fact, uh, when I was trying to think of the title for these for this series, I thought about calling it house arrest because that's exactly where Paul is. And many of us feel like we're kind of under house arrest as well as we can't leave and do the things that we want. But Paul here is under house arrest in Rome for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was put there, but he was still allowed to have correspondence and to write letters uh, to some of the churches that he planted. And Timothy, although he is listed, is not there in house arrest with him, but but he was his companion. And it says that this is written to all of God's people at Philippi. Now, Philippi well, these people, along with their overseers and deacons, uh, was a church in a city in northern Greece at the time. And you hear a little bit of how this church was started, and you can read about it in Acts chapter 16. It's pretty cool. So in Acts chapter 16, God comes to the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit and says, I want you to go to the region of Macedonia. Paul goes to the region of Macedonia, comes into the city of Philippi, and soon meets this woman named Lydia. Lydia is a clothing uh, saleswoman. In fact, it says that's what she does. Paul meets her. He shares with her the good news of Jesus Christ. She gets saved. She goes home to her family. She tells her family about Jesus. Her family convert to Christianity. The next person that Paul and Silas walk uh, have um, interaction with is actually a demon-possessed woman. Woman. And they cast out the demon out of this woman. She gets saved, and it causes this problem to where the people who owned her essentially were mad at Paul because he had converted her and she was no longer demon possessed, and they couldn't use her to make money. So they called the police. The police threw Paul and Silas in prison, uh, awaiting their trial. And while they were there, God created an, a huge earthquake to free them from the jail. And because of the earthquake, the guard that was set outside of a Paul and Silas's prison saw the great things that God did. Paul shared the gospel with him. He converted. He went home, talked to his family about Jesus. They converted. And this, these people were the first core team that started the church at Philippi. And this book of Philippians was written back to these people Some of them may have even been elders and deacons in this church of Philippi, but he wrote this letter 11 years later. So it's been 11 years since he had visited this church. And so Paul finds himself writing a letter to people that he dearly loves, and he's all alone. He's in house arrest. And I think there's an aspect here where Paul is beginning to feel a sense of loneliness that he never had before. And in this letter, Paul is going to express some things that can help us find or even hold on to our joy in our loneliness. Now, when we talk about loneliness, I want to be really clear. There's lots of different types of loneliness that we experience in our lives. We can experience physical loneliness where we're alone in our own home. Maybe it's because of divorce or other circumstances where we live alone and we don't have anyone else with us. And so we we experience loneliness just purely because we're by ourselves for far too long. Loneliness can also be emotional. It can be a feeling that we have inside of us. Even though we may be surrounded by people that love us and that we love, we can be emotionally alone where we say things like, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't know what it's like to walk in my shoes. That can be caused by past trauma, some current frustrations of life. We could feel emotional uh, loneliness because of the problems that we're facing disengaged spouses in our homes. And even though we're surrounded by people physically, emotionally, we feel very alone. Loneliness can also become spiritual where we feel like God has left us or that he's not paying attention to us, that our prayers are not being answered. And so we can experience physical loneliness, emotional loneliness, and spiritual loneliness. And I just want to say this as a side note right now. If, if you're experiencing loneliness 
and it's beginning to manifest itself in depression and you can't get yourself out of it and you've been praying and asking God to pull you through it, but it's just not seeming to work right now. I just want to encourage you to, if you're feeling lonely and depressed, that it's okay and it's good to go and seek professional help. Go find a therapist that can help you walk through this because there may be more going on with your loneliness than just what I've talked about here. But nevertheless, Paul is experiencing, my guess is, physical and emotional loneliness. And so there he lies in house arrest. And he knows that the enemy wants to steal his joy. And so he, in the midst of his loneliness, gives us some insights on how we too can hold on to our joy when we're feeling lonely. The first thing that that I see when I look through this is that Paul kept his heart focused on other people. This opening letter to these people, 11 years after he had started this church, he still, he says, I thank God every time I remember you. In verse seven, he says, it's right for me to feel this way all about you since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending the gospel, I know that you are always with me. In verses 9 through 11, he prays for other people in the midst of his loneliness. See, loneliness... When we, loneliness begins to, to, to leave us when our hearts move off of ourselves and the experiences that we're going through, and we begin to think about the needs and the concerns of other people. Where Paul sits in house arrest here, his, his heart is focused on others. Now, you probably know this if you've experienced loneliness, but loneliness is, is very real. But it's unfortunately a very selfish or, center, or self-centered state of being. It robs us of our joy because it steals our thoughts about what's really going on around us and the people that are around us. Loneliness continually feels like there is nothing or there's nobody and there's nothing that can be done to pull us into the presence of other people. And Paul, in his loneliness, is concerned with and praying for others. And I just want to, if you know of someone who's experiencing loneliness in their lives, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, God has called you to reach out to them to minister to them, to offer prayer to them, to be a friend to them, to serve them, and to remind them that they are not lonely. But if you're personally in a place where you're experiencing loneliness, you may be in a place where you're neglecting the relationships around you. And Philippians 1 here is reminding us that if we keep our eyes not focused on ourselves and what we don't have, Paul is reminding us to pray for and to be reminded of all the people that he has in his life around him. See, it's taking his eyes off of himself and onto the needs of others that allows him to, to what he says here is to pray with joy for other people. And he's praying with joy because he's remembering their partnership that they had together. And he's reminding of all that God has done in and through them together. And so one of the ways that Paul shows us that we can keep the joy alive in us is to keep our hearts focused on other people. The second thing that I see as I read through this that Paul did to keep his joy was that he kept his mind focused on God's continual work in him and in the people that he loved. One of the most famous verses in the entire book of Philippians is Philippians 1.6. And you may have heard it before. Paul says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Here's the point. Whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that you're struggling with, it's a season. And with God's help, you're going to get through it. Because here's the good news. God is not done with you. You may feel like you're at the end of your rope or you're at the, 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 the pinnacle of, of everything that life has to offer to you. You may feel like you've reached some level of spiritual maturity that, that you've always wanted or maybe you feel stuck spiritually. This verse reminds us that God is never, ever done with us and he, he's confident that he who began this good work of the gospel in you he will carry it on to completion. It's not a burden that you have to carry. It's not a burden that you have to worry about, that he has a plan for your life and that he is continually working in on on you. And in our loneliness, very often we think that we're stuck 
or that there's nothing else that we can do because we're looking around us and going, there are people that are further down the road than I am and I'm never gonna get there. I'm never gonna see the completion of what God wants to do in me. It reminds me of when I go to the gym and I enjoy going to the gym a lot. Maybe I don't always look like it, but when I go, and you probably experience this too if, you, if you're around people that exercise a lot, is that I look at other people and I, I see that men and women that are faster than me and stronger than me and can do more movements than I can. And I look and I go, man, like, why aren't I in that place? I wish I could be more like that. I wish I could be at the place that they were at. I wish I could be bigger, faster, stronger, whatever it may be. And I'm looking at down the road at what I'm not. And then I have to remind myself when I, my mind starts to go in, in that direction is that I have to look back and realize how far I've come. That two, three years ago, I couldn't lift that. I couldn't run that far. I couldn't do any of those movements. And spiritually, I think we need to take, take a posture that very often we think we're some sort of professional athlete, especially at Christianity, or we've got this thing nailed, or maybe we look at other people as these spiritual giants and say that we're never going to be there because we think that there is some sort of like, like spiritual or Christian guru that one day we are going to be able to attain. And that may be what's kept you away from the Christian faith because you never felt like you could measure up. But here, here's, here's what I want to say. I, I view myself in the gym and even in my own faith, I view myself more as a stumbling toddler than I do a professional athlete. But when I look back on everything that God has done in me, it restores my joy that because six months ago or a year ago, I couldn't do those things. I didn't know how to do those things. For some of you, this needs to be a reminder to stop focusing on how far you need to go in your faith and to be reminded just how far you've come. Six months ago or a year ago or two years ago, you didn't even have a relationship with God. You didn't know how to read your Bible. You didn't know how to pray. You didn't have a church family surrounding you, but now you do. And so when we're reminded of the fact that none of us are perfect, None of us have arrived at any sort of spiritual perfection and we're grateful for how far we've come in becoming more like Jesus. It pulls us out of our heads and restores our joy in where God has us right now. The third thing I see in this passage, and I think this is most important, is that the Apostle Paul, and you're gonna see this all throughout this book, he never takes his eyes off of Jesus. His eyes are never on the circumstances of where his life is at. He says that whether I am in chains or whether I'm defending and confirming the gospel, God's grace is with me. See, I like to, call, I like to say that the Apostle Paul had something called unshakable joy. That no, there was nothing that could ever rob him of his joy. Why? Why? because his confidence was not in the circumstances of happiness. His confidence was in Jesus Christ. Because Paul knew this, and you know this to be true too, if you're a follower of Christ. Paul knew that his joy was in Jesus because he knew what Jesus meant to him. Paul's life was plucked out of a, out of a life of pride and persecuting other Christians, and Jesus saved him. Paul was given a purpose for his life. Paul was surrounded by amazing brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul was empowered by the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus and to do more ministry and more missions and more good, not because of his work, but because of the work of the Holy Spirit in him. He, because of the gospel, because of what Jesus did for him and died on the cross and resurrected, knew that he was promised an eternal life with Jesus. Now, was Paul perfect? No way. Neither are you. In fact, there's a point in, in one of those other letters where Paul says he's the worst of sinners. But here's the deal. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, all of these things that were true for Paul are also true for you. This is why you and I can declare the words from Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not, are not worth comparing to the glory that will, will be revealed in us. See, in our loneliness, the challenge and the encouragement is, is to take our eyes off of the circumstances that have been robbed from us and begin to place them in the unshakable person of Jesus Christ. These are some of the surefire ways to increase the odds 
of our joy never being stolen away from us because Christ, the people around us and the work of God creates a foundation and it creates a grasp by which joy cannot be stolen. So if you're experiencing some sense of loneliness today, I just want to remind you that in Christ, you are never alone. You're never alone. When you have Christ with you, he is always there with you. And you have people around you that love you, that care about you, and don't want your joy to be robbed from you. And lastly, never forget, God's not done with you. There is so much more in store to what he wants to do in and through you. And don't allow the enemy to steal and rob the joy that he has for you, even when you're feeling lonely. Let's pray. Our our Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for your word that encourages us and reminds us that you have never left us. You have never forsaken us. And that the present sufferings and struggles and temptations that we're going through are only temporary, God, and that our eternal hope and our joy is in the work that you're doing in and through us. I just pray for those that are maybe watching that are feeling lonely today. Holy Spirit, will you encourage them and remind them of the truth of your word today? And if there are people that that you're bringing onto our hearts and our minds right now that are lonely, I pray that, that you would prompt us to reach out to them and to show the love of Jesus Christ in the best way we know how. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. We're gonna hand it off to uh, Brian and Hannah for one more song before we close this service out. God bless you all.
Just you. 